Uh, just round of applause for all the presentations so far. They've been great. Uh, I've learned a ton. Uh, yeah, lots of great speakers. You know, we're just uh, thankful uh, to be on the stage here. So uh, we'll get into this real quick here. Uh, my name is Will. This is Sean. We're from Fortress. Uh, it is a, a security division of an MSP up in Cleveland, Ohio. That's right, Pittsburgh. You have a Browns fan that has infiltrated your conference. So go Browns. <laughs> But why don't we go ahead and get into things here. We're going to do a talk over a, uh, a pretty interesting IR case that we worked earlier this year. I'm uh, going to hopefully show you some, some inside details on uh, a pretty unique situation. So uh, let's go ahead and move forward here. So we'll go through, uh, just do some quick bios for me and Sean, so you know who uh, you're talking to here. Uh, then we'll walk through, we'll take a look at the victim organization, uh, give you some details as much as we can uh, about uh, the victim that, that uh, this attack happened to. And then we're going to go through some initial IOCs that we were discovered. Uh, we'll then get into our first phase of incident response once my team was engaged, detection analysis and initial containment. We'll also walk through some threat actor negotiations. Uh, talk a little bit about what that process looks like, some key things you need to pay attention to when you're going through that process. Uh, and then we'll get into some uh, law enforcement engagement and uh, the threat actor profile, uh, which we determined by, uh, our, through our friends at the FBI. Um, and then that led to some additional investigation, which eventually led us to find the root cause of how this happened. Uh, again, you know, this is an actual event that we, that we worked. Um, we've redacted all of the sensitive information, but hopefully show you some pretty cool things from uh, a case that we have here. So again, my name is Will Hudek. Uh, I am the Director of Incident Response. Um, I've been in the industry about seven years now. Uh, I'm CISSP certified over the last, I would say, three to four years. I've worked over 100 security incidents, ransomware, business email compromise, uh, you name it, I've worked it. Obviously, this picture was taken before I worked over 100 incidents over three years, <laughs> as my gray hairs can probably also attest to. So go ahead, Sean. Uh, I'm Sean Newman. Um, primarily, my background comes from dot .mil and the Intel community. Uh, primarily, before I came over to Fortress, I do threat actor negotiations. I'm the guy that talks to the bad guy. Uh, so we'll get a little bit deeper into that. Um, but I guess my... Oh, sorry about that. I guess, um, so one of the biggest things I've worked on is I've worked a lot with DC3 and the defense industrial base, helped set that up. And, um, and I helped establish the CNO capabilities for DDX, the 21st century destroyer. Okay. And we'll have time for questions at the end, but if there's any as we go along, feel free to pop your hand up and we can, we can have time. We, you know, we don't think we'll need the full session here, so wanna take questions as we come along. All right, so the victim profile. So it's a small organization, uh, about 100 employees. Um, they had access to sensitive client legal information uh, as well as PII, as, as most organizations do. Uh, the compromise occurred earlier this year. It was you know, Q1 of this year, uh, and it involved exfiltrating sensitive data. Um, the threat actor then proceeded to attempt to extort the client. So this is probably going to be a little hard to read. This is the very first thing of how we determined what was happening. Uh, you can see here the threat actor actually sent an email to uh, a whole bunch of the organization's employees. Uh, they were stating that they had access to gigabytes of their sensitive data. Uh, all of those attachments there were a way that they were trying to demonstrate the proof that they had exfiltrated this data. Um, and, you know, uh, again, we can't get into the specifics of those screenshots and such, but essentially evidence that they had been within in the environment. Um, you know, organizations get these types of, hey, we have your data threats all the time. Because of the magnitude of what this reached, um, senior members of the organization all, all throughout, uh, this obviously had a, a very high lens uh, from a leadership perspective. And they, you know, immediately contacted us and contacted their, their outside counsel to make sure that we could start understanding, is this an actual threat? Did they actually take the data? What evidence can we provide? Um, they, make some th they make some comments throughout this that state, you know, we've done this before. We're a professional organization. Uh, you can see some of the work we've done in the news um, and, you know, essentially stating that you need to start communicating with us as soon as possible um, so that we can come to a resolution on this, this data. 
So this threat actor was very aggressive, uh, one of the most that we've seen. Um, I'm going to play this here in a moment, but they were actually calling employees of this organization, and uh, most of them actually never picked up, but they were leaving them voicemails, uh, threatening them, uh, threatening to call their clients, threatening to uh, expose the information, and essentially demanding that they open up a line of communication. So let me go ahead and play this here. Actually, actually have, have the files, files and, and we are ready, ready to present, present an evidence, evidence uh, of those files, files and, and we want, want to help you solve this problem peacefully without, without any damage for their organization. Um, and in, in order, order to do this, you need to start communicating with us. Just send us an email, email and uh, we will go help you solve this problem. problem. Otherwise, we will start reaching out to your clients with their confidential data and eventually we will post everything on our website. Again, Again, we do not, not want this to happen, so, so please talk to other partners and uh, finally send us an email. Thank you. It's funny, we don't want this to happen, it was one of the last things they said there, right? It's like, it's like the, the bank robber holding the gun to the teller's head saying, I don't want to take your money. Okay, well you did. <laughs> you. Right, yeah, they're very polite, yeah. Um, so obviously this was very aggressive. Um, you know, Sean, I know with your background, you know, it was interesting that they didn't seem to use a voice scrambler at all. Yeah. Um, you know, it seemed to be just their natural voice. So if you want to maybe speak a yeah. little bit to that. So in cases like this, um, the first thing, the email, the reason they sent it out to a larger group is to create, emo like, warrant emotion. As human beings, we are not going to act appropriately with emotion. Our client obviously did the right thing. They contacted law enforcement, they contacted their insurance, and they got a third party involved. Uh, also, one of the motivations for doing that is they eliminate containment. By sitting out to a larger group, the, the organization can't particularly say, hey, don't say anything, because it went to so many different people. So that also makes the organization have to do e-discovery efforts to figure out who did this email go to. Um, the threat actors, and, and they up the ante. The reason that the calls happen is in that lull where we're going through transition from having that organization transition all comms over to us, there's a delay. So they want to, once again, get you in that heightened emotional state. Obviously, we're a third party firm, so we don't, and we have experience with this, so it doesn't warrant any emotion on our end. And, we, and also what we do is we gather a lot of actionable intelligence as is going through, um, accent from the person that you're speaking to. Uh, I've done over 500 of these, so you can identify certain accents, certain dialects, word usage, and also you can cross-pollinate that with the email, and you can ascertain if, the, if it's one entity that did that threat actor communicator on the bad guy side, uh, on the threat actor side, is it the same person that actually placed the call? So you can, you know, so once you do text-to-speech, you can, you can notice certain similarities or dissimilarities. So now you know if you're dealing with a hacktivist, is it ransom as a service, even though there was no ransomware? Is it, or is it a bad actor cell? And when you contact the FBI, those are things that if you have that actionable intelligence, they can respond more quickly if you're working with them. Yeah, and, and all of that part, you know, in terms of the experience that we have, we try to see if we can find out information based on, on some of those same indicators as well. Um, actually, and, and one of the other things I'll mention here, uh, at the beginning of the voicemail, they actually called out the person by name. Obviously, we had to remove that here. But again, just trying to put people into a heightened sense of emotion um, and you know, act uh, irrationally, uh, potentially uh, lashing out or, or anything like that. So uh, the other piece here that was really interesting with this, uh, this case, and we'll talk about what we did for investigation, but we didn't find any signs of malware. There was, wasn't a ransomware. We didn't see any sort of lock bits or any of the, the big actors or even some of the smaller ones. Uh, nothing was encrypted that we could tell. All their systems were up and online. Um, so, uh, so pretty unique. You know, typically we see this type of extortion come after a ransomware attack as a way to, again, heighten the sense of urgency. My voice uh, I just, just want, want to say, say that, that um, so then, you know, our team engaged, uh, you know, the first step uh, for, for any incident response team, uh, you know, we deployed our, our EDR tool. Uh, we use Sentinel-1. Uh, our friends are here today, so feel free to stop by and say hello. Um, but that's one of the first things that uh, most groups do, you know, any of the big players, they'll use their, their, their tool of preference, whether it's CrowdStrike or others, uh, to get containment within the environment. So we deploy Sentinel-1 out for, for two purposes. 
One, we want to contain the environment to understand what's happening, if there is any malware that might not have been triggered by their, uh, their antivirus, that we're catching that. Um, and it also gives us visibility into the environment, which I'll talk to here in a moment. Uh, the other piece that we performed uh, as part of our containment efforts are pretty, pretty standard as well. We made sure all admin account passwords were reset. Uh, that's priority number one. And then obviously rolling into a full company-wide password reset just to ensure there's no account compromise that might be leading into this, uh, you know, this intrusion. Uh, the one piece here, you know, once we got into starting to try to determine how in the world did this happen, what information do we have available to us that we can uh, start to leverage to see is this a legitimate threat um, or are they just uh, trying to, to extort a payment even though they don't have this? Uh, was logging. And I know there was a couple talks uh, today talking about the importance of logging and being able to preserve that. We had maybe a couple of days worth of logging, which will, is important. We'll get into it here in a mo uh, more, more close to the end. But heavily constrained by the lack of logging, we absolutely could not find anything out. Traffic looked normal. There was a couple IPs that looked a little suspicious, but traffic was being blocked there, so it wasn't a, a big area of concern. Uh, we started to step into our forensic process, uh, you know, using kind of two tools, you know, uh, native PowerShell scripts that we have for collecting for forensic evidence and trying to do some live analysis of systems to see is there anything in the processes that are happening that seem suspicious, any way they're trying to obfuscate their presence in the environment. And then we also used, uh, through Sentinel-1, there's, a, there's a, mo a module called Deep Visibility. Uh, which again is is a way to just get uh, you know do some threat hunting and see if there's anything we could find that's that's suspicious. But uh, once again, we couldn't find any sort of trace of any compromise, suspicious activity. And we weren't getting pointed um, in any sort of direction. So uh, with that, we were uh, we were forced essentially to open up uh, threat actor negotiations. So. Uh, because we were so constrained, we determined, and, and I'll let Sean chime in here, he was the one who uh, actually communicated with the threat actor. Um, we were forced to open up the communication, see what they would provide us uh, for that. So I think, Sean, maybe we can oh. talk first about some key considerations yeah. that you take into account when you first open that dialogue sure. with the threat actor. So if you're ever in a situation that you need, that you have, that you're forced to either buy time. So just because you open negotiations does not mean you're gonna pay the ransom. We, we run into a lot. Sometimes you're just buying time for the forensics team to figure out, you know, is there a hostile payload there? Uh, what types of data? How much data was exfiltrated? Um, but there are three rules. You never disclose your firm, counsel, or carrier. So you never mention those. They know who they compromise. You never want to reiterate that. Now, when you are talking to the threat actor, you do want to personalize yourself as a person. So sometimes you may give misinformation. If this doesn't go my way, I might get terminated. You definitely don't want to ever sit, put yourself in a situation that you work for accounts payable because accounts payable obviously has fast line to the money. Um, it also, you don't want, everyone in this room is probably technical folks, I assume. You also want to play really dumb, like, like SMTP, what's that? Um, <laughs> you know, what are you talking about? What is this? What is data exfil? What do you mean you took something? Did someone email it to you? You do want to ask those, I always say, ask the questions your grandparents would ask you, you know, to the threat actor, because it lets them think that they're really positively in control before you take control back from them. Um, threat actor communication is more of an art than a skill. The more you do it, the better you get, and the better, you know, usually after a couple lines of dialogue, I can usually narrow down who the threat actor group is by how they communicate, what threats they levy, and most of them, just like telemarketers for any major company, they run by a script. So they have their own TTPs and are all unique. I know uh, North Koreans, TTPs are totally different than Russian nation state foreign actors. Um, what else do we have? Sorry. I yeah, I think some of the other things here, and I'll let you chime in again, but again, I mean, these are very self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. Don't use any sort of email account if, it's, if it has to be done by email that they can somehow uh, track back to you as a person. You know, we want to engage with them and, and build that personal relationship, as crazy as that sounds, without them knowing who you actually are. Uh, so using things like burner emails, uh, VPNs to obfuscate your actual location, um, and, and then also making changes to that as well. So it's not just about using a VPN, you know, you're coming out of 
California instead of uh, you know Ohio, um, but changing that around, uh, communicating at different times. We want to make sure that um, we are uh, you know using using that advantage to try to you know cover our tracks in this as well. Because if they find out who you are, there's a chance of retaliation, and they'll come after you to try to stop the efforts that you're doing for the client. And, and then go ahead, Sean. Uh, so one thing about utilizing a VPN is they're smart. So if you move your location, I've had thrashers say, hey, you were in Miami this morning, now you're in Colorado. That's actionable intelligence you can give to law enforcement. You know that they're checking now. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the easiest solution, hey, you know, work forces me to use this stupid tool and I use it and it just picks somewhere so I might be in Tibet tomorrow, I have no clue. Like I said, I always talk to the threat actors, though you're talking to your grandparents, you know, just play very, very stupid. Um, and they will guide you through. Uh, I've had cases in the past I've, that I've played so dumb that they've given their whereabouts and we've caught the threat actor. That they gave so much aggregate information when we gave it to law enforcement. Law enforcement gave it to the Canadian government, and they caught the guy. So if you guys, everyone here has a phone, if you Google it, you'll know exactly what case it was. <laughs> um, you know, so things like that, it, those are really important to, and also capture everything. Um, everything that they say, don't discard any legal artifacts, make a, make a copy, keep a running copy in Word, um, it, because, you know, obviously some of these, like Proton Mail, which is what I, is my favorite to use um, because you, and if they ask why'd you use first email you know that that's blocked you're like oh it's just most secure email and he pops up number one in my Yahoo uh, things like that uh, those are things that you you're building their trust a little bit as well because ultimately if you do have to pay the objective is to pay the least amount possible to protect your client and protect their insurance carrier mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and this last point here, as Sean already kind of mentioned, the other, you know, as much as information as we can find, whether it's, you know, again, it's, it's a little bit of an art. It takes some experience getting through these types of cases. Uh, but then you start to build your knowledge base and understand, okay, uh, this, this group we're dealing with right now, they might not have the same emails or it might not sound like the same people, but they're talking in the same way for another case. So, it, again, it just gives us intelligence as an incident response team to go back and see, what t you know what ttps did that group use what iocs do we know that are out there for them and help us uh, narrow down our, our investigations so uh, we're going to get into some of the actual uh communications back and forth uh so i'm going to go ahead here um so uh, the email on top was us reaching out to the threat actor uh there's a couple reasons why uh we would do this um one if we have to negotiate some sort of ransom uh, if it's a ransomware case, we can't decrypt. It's a business decision at that point. Uh, obviously, we don't encourage paying any ransom. Um, you're funding organized crime at that point, but that's always a consideration if a business cannot continue to operate without getting a decryptor. Um, and then, obviously, there's a couple other reasons you would want to negotiate. Um, so proof of life. How can you prove that you have taken what you've taken, which I'll have Sean speak to here in a minute. You can see in the, uh, the uh, communication here, we're asking for some files. Um, so we want them to validate that they've actually taken the data to know if that's a risk that we have to consider. Um, and then obviously the other piece is to buy time. You know, if we need to buy time to try to understand can we restore, can we get back to business functions in ransomware, um, or can the investigation pinpoint that they don't actually have data so we don't have to pay them. So, yeah. good, Sean. Um, so if you notice, every error, even in the emails that we sent to the threat actors, the misspellings, um, things like that, like, like so it should say this is, but it says his is, um, are all intentional um, because going by the nature of the organization, they wouldn't make someone that's in a key role wouldn't make a mistake like that. So anything that throws them off balance, if you're supposed to be the head of help desk, you need to make, or in this case, I wasn't, I was just, uh, you know, just someone they nominated that wasn't at the top of the company. Uh, so you have to make sure you sell your persona because you're personalizing yourself. Um, this is very formal, but if you would have saw the messages in between, a lot of them were informal. Sorry, I was out and eating dinner with my wife. I missed your message. Sorry for the delay, you know, because they did retaliate and say, hey, if you don't respond quickly. So you, by saying, hey, I have a life, you're not really saying that, but you're like, hey, I was at a dinner with my family, whatever, and I, um, I cannot disclose this to my family, what's going on, you're personalizing yourself. So when you get down to the financial transactions, they're, they're, they know you're a 
person. Um, if you ever get burned and they find out that you're an experienced ransom negotiator, it's full price, no discount, nothing, nothing you're going to do about it. If they want a million dollars, you're paying them a million dollars. So the objective is to make sure you, your identity doesn't get burned or that you're not hired from the outside. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that does happen, believe it or not. Um, I've dealt with threat actors. Uh, I had a case with Maze, and then I had another case with Maze, and the next time I realized I was talking to the exact same person, and he sent me a back channel email to the, to the old email. And once I read it, he knew. It was re-received, he knew. He's like, okay, I know who you are. When I, but even in that case, you can recover. Hey, okay, you, you know what's going on. They only have X amount of dollars. I'm not gonna play games with you. Now they had more, but you're like, this is all they have. Can they get more? No, they can't. This is all they got. So it works. Yeah, and so um, from there you can see in, in their response, it was, it was a kind of a unique situation. Generally when we ask for that proof of life, uh, like I said, they'll usually offer up some files uh, that they'll give us. They actually sent us a file tree and let us select five of anything in that list. So again, just trying to prove that they had everything that they had. Uh, so that text file is essentially the tree and we, we selected five uh, files, which you'll see here in a moment. Um, you can see in, in the, the comments here, you know, they say, hey, we'll stop reaching out to your employees. Um, you know, at this time, continue to communicate with us so that we can come to a, a resolution here quickly. Uh, so here, you can see on the bottom uh, part uh, where it's kind of mostly covered up, this was, uh, again, Sean. Uh, he had sent the five files that he wanted to see. So we worked with the client uh, to understand what uh, you know, what do you want us to pick out of these five? And something that they could easily verify was from their environment uh, that they, without a doubt, would say, yeah, this, this came from us. Uh, so we picked those five, and you, as you can see, it might be a little tough to read, but each one of the uh, file extensions that we asked for, so there was uh, three PDFs, a message, and JPEG, uh, they returned and attached to us. So at this point, um, we feel that they have the data that they claim to have. You know, it's you know, without a reasonable doubt. I mean, we, they, they've got it. Uh, so at this point, um, and I'll play this here in a moment, uh, we, we slowed communications down because the client uh, wasn't sure what they wanted to do. They weren't sure if they wanted to continue to negotiate and maybe make a payment to prevent possible disclosure or them continuing this, this, call, this call path. Uh, they uh, were... Uh, you know, nervous about how that uh, would damage their brand and reputation. Obviously, that's a big impact there. Uh, so we slowed down and we didn't communicate as frequently as we were before. Um, and lo and behold, they started calling again. You are not replying to us in the chat anymore. And uh, we're not, not sure what is the reason for it. But, uh, we are asking you to start answering. We, we want to find a beneficial solution. solution. If you, you didn't like, like our, our offer, we are, we are promising you will find, 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 find a better solution. solution. Just uh, uh, continue communicating, because if you are not going to do, so start, start calling your, your clients to send their, their data. data. You, you do not, not want this to happen. And you do not, not want, want to do, do this. this. We, we want still want to find a solution. We got your offer, and we will get, get close to your, your number. number. Just keep, keep communicating. communicating. This is not, not the way it's going to be solved. solved. So, so we'll be waiting on your email. email. Thank you. So once again, they don't want to do this. <laughs> yeah. um, so obviously there's, some, there's a higher threat there. We're going to start calling your clients. We're going to provide them the data we've stolen. Uh, one thing that I uh, didn't point out before, but in this email that they responded, their initial ransom demand was $600,000. Um, and, and, you know, I don't think they specified here, but they might uh, to be paid in Bitcoin um, as, as typical for, for these types of negotiations. So that was the initial demand. While all this is going on, while all this is going on, in parallel, our forensics team is still doing their due diligence. So they're still trying to make sure that there are, that there's no hostile payloads. So we have to slow down before we start negotiations because obviously, you know, if we, anything can happen. You know, if we discover, hey, they said they took this much data and they actually took more data, we find those kind of things, then that $600,000 price tag starts to look pretty good. 
But when we realized that they're honest and the data elements and the data sets they took weren't critical data, then you know we have to actually start costing the data. Also in parallel, Will and I are also communicating with them because they didn't do a business impact analysis. They didn't do a data for classification. So they don't know how much their data is worth and we're trying to rush a BIA, an informal BIA process, so we know what to pay. You know, Everybody in this room will buy a Rolls Royce for $20, but you know, no one's gonna buy a Matchbox car for $20. But they're both cars, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. So at this point, um, again, with, a, with the lack of evidence, we engage the FBI uh, uh, on the client's behalf. Um, we provided them what we had, uh, which was the email. Uh, we also provided some of the communications back and forth, uh, as well as the voicemail. Uh, they pinpointed that it's, and this was most likely, and it, it turned out it, it, it was, uh, this group called Silent Ransom Group. Um, so some of the things that they were uh, most known for is this, what's called this bizarre call, uh, essentially callback phishing method, um, which you can see there in the infographic on the top right. The way this works is it's social engineering. Uh, they re they uh, initially send some type of phishing email. So you can see down there, uh, the Duolingo and the Masterclass, those were two known TTPs that they had, specifically impersonating uh, those two services. You get an email like that, it says your account's due, give us a call, uh, and it gives you some sort of customer service number if you have any questions. When you call, it's not Duolingo or Masterclass customer service, it is a threat actor group who then, through social engineering techniques, convinces you to install um, uh, some type of application onto your device. Uh, so generally what this group uses is RMM tools, which again, this goes back to the very beginning of what this title is. It's called Living Off the Land. They are putting something into the environment that's not gonna be caught by EDR, it's not gonna be caught by antivirus, and unless you have good controls around what applications can be installed, you're gonna, it's gonna go unnoticed. So this group has been, again, you know, that's their typical, uh, uh, TTPs, you know, following this process, the social engineering through phishing, through the callbacks, and eventually maintaining a foothold in the environment through known applications. Um, the other intel that we found is that they actually generally do follow through with their promises uh, when, when you, you do pay. Um, they've found that, that, you know, they do provide the things that they'll provide, which is uh, a proof of deletion as well as a security report. Let's just call it an unauthorized pen test, right? How did we get into your environment? <laughs> so, um, they, you know, and, and we'll take a look, uh, you know, kind of as this wraps up uh, on some points there. So, uh, so with those additional TTPs from the FBI, uh, we went back and started to search. Uh, through the environment, we started to look to see, is there anything that matches maybe those uh, uh, the Duolingo or the Masterclass, are we seeing any uh, traffic that you know, could be in their email uh, system? Um, and then you'll see here in a moment, but we've, we pretty much matched the exact threat, threat vector that this group uses to, to the client. Uh, so after we found this, we found phishing emails uh, to a handful of users. Uh, we also then found, uh, you know, uh, after narrowing it down some more, uh, Zoho Assist, you know, an RMM tool that this group is also known to use, was installed on one of the uh, user's devices. Uh, so from there, um, you know, that's what they use to maintain persistence within the environment, and ultimately what they use to extract the, uh, the data. Uh, so again, evading detection uh, through social engineering and through using, you know, known good tools that wouldn't be caught by, uh, you know, security controls. Uh, so you can see here, again, these were the actual emails that we found uh, in the environment of, for, for two of the end users. Uh, match exactly the samples that we had from before. Uh, so same thing, you know, we've, we've blocked out some of the names and, and the phone numbers there, but uh, the same pieces there. With the installation of Sentinel-1, Will's team was really quick to ascertain that Zoho Assist was the culprit because it gives a hardware and, and software asset inventory. So Will's team was really fast to be able to say, are you using, they came up with a laundry list of applications that could have been a problem. They already spoke with the FBI and they went through, I think it was like six or seven applications that our forensics team had came up with. And they said, we've never used that. So we knew, so we could pretty much pin down 
what machines it was installed on, so hence you can ascertain who patient zero is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. And obviously the root cause here is the dread of any organization. What keeps us up at night, what you know, drives a lot of these uh, these attacks is the end users had local admin privileges. So they convinced them to download and install this. It went right in. Uh, so we'll go through a couple more slides here, um, and then we can get to some questions. So kind of as a summary of what happened, and we'll talk kind of two places here. So just to reiterate, again, they were a victim of the callback phishing uh, attack. Uh, eventually convinced them to install an RMM tool uh, to main pay, maintain persistence. Because of the way that user privileges were set up, they had access to all kinds of sensitive information that they probably shouldn't have. Um, and then, you know, they slowly extorted or slowly siphoned off information from the environment, uh, eventually to extort the, the client. So obviously from a recommendation standpoint, we're going to get into the ransom here in a moment. Um, you know, obviously monitor RMM tools within your environment. Make sure you're blocking those uh, that, you're, that aren't in use. Uh, controlling local admin rights is, you know, the, the very first step. Um, access control to sensitive information and good security awareness training making sure that people understand you know, what's out there. Um, so I'll, I'll let Sean chime in here in a moment. Uh, so the two emails you see here on the left, this is when we had agreed to a payment. So unfortunately, uh, the client felt the risk was pretty high, uh, didn't want you know, the reputational damage that would go along with this. Obviously, they had to make disclosures no matter what, um, but didn't want it to be you know, on Channel 8 News broadcast all over the place that this was happening. Uh, so they decided to make a payment. Um, so that's them sharing their Bitcoin wallet for making the transaction. Uh, once we made that transaction, uh, the security report is what's on the right there. Um, so again, uh, they got access to uh, you know, company computers by using remote desktop software. We found that. Um, they bypassed the antivirus, got deeper into that, again, using known tools. Um, and then they got access to the corporate data. Uh, here's their recommendations, uh, regular penetration testing, uh, uh, prevent certain types of attacks uh, for, uh, such as pass the hash um, and then multi-factor authentication. And then they also, which we'll see here in a moment, is pretty, pretty interesting. They provided a video of proof of deletion of the files. So we'll take a look at that in a moment. But Sean, why don't you talk about the negotiation and kind of getting to that, uh, that final price? So as we were going through the process to keep them alive, you know, the client, basically keep negotiations moving so that they wouldn't publish their data. Um, what we did is we entered into basically sleep depriving the threat actor, which also means that we're also sleep deprived since I'm an army of one. Um, so by keeping them active and constantly communicating with them because we're being compliant to what they want, hey, communicate with us, uh, we managed to get the ransom, I can't give the exact amount, but let's say less than $40,000 from, six, from 600,000. They were just ready to quit. They were, just, they were over it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's when you start as a thrasher negotiator. You say, hey, part of something is better than nothing. And because they knew at that point in time, um, the client has to do disclosures anyway. So what value is it really paying it? Um, so the thrashers, they're, they're well-versed. Now, granted, by that time, they pretty much know you're a professional and they know you they know, they know, you know what you're doing. So at that point, um, they became pretty compliant. Um, there's always a risk of, uh, of secondary extortion, like you pay them and then they come back and say, no, we want more money. Um, that has happened, that's happened to Will and I, it happens to the best of us, it, you can't prevent it from happening. But, um, but these TTPs from this particular threat actor group, um, the FBI had said that's not something that they ordinarily do. They don't want you to publicize that they double extort because once it gets out in the industry, because if they double extort us, I would tell each of you, each of you here, if you ever hear anybody, but like they're gonna double extort you, uh, it's that simple to get the information out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, a, a reduction in, in that much is pretty abnormal. Um, you know, we, we see 20 to 30% generally, but to get down that low, you know, uh, credit to Sean and his persistence there. Um, the last thing we're gonna show you here, and we'll have some time for questions. Generally, we always get this promise for whether it's ransomware or other groups. We, we, we promise to delete your data. They, ge they generally don't show that they've deleted their data. And obviously there's always the risk that they've made other copies. So in this case, they actually did. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and play this video here.
Uh, so everything there we've obviously blacked out, so we can't we don't show any uh, of the client's actual files. But what they're doing here is they're uh, scrolling through the various directories. They're showing the files that they have. You can see in confidential there's a significant amount there. And then they're going forward and they're reformatting the disk to completely clear it out. <laughs> And then at the end, they go back, format's complete, and they show, ah, it's gone. Abracadabra. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that was um, you know, a pretty interesting case we worked. You know, we've seen a lot, a pretty significant increase in this type of persistence in the environment. Uh, using more known good tools as opposed to malware, right? They're trying to bypass our security controls. Uh, EDR has been, you know, widely implemented with a lot of organizations now. Uh, so they're trying to bypass in any way they can. Uh, you know, I've worked several cases just over the past, I would say, nine months or so where they've used these exact tactics to stay within the environment. So with that, any closing from you, Sean? Any questions that anyone has? Really, it doesn't accomplish anything. Um, they made good on their promise, so they continue to have a reputation for uh, following through. So that might convince more people to pay them. But for the actual organization, there's always a risk they have copies. So for the organization, they still have to go through disclosure uh, that the data was exfiltrated. They still have to go through all those legal and compliance pieces. You get it? So, yeah, uh, we, Will and I had a case. Um, there are not every, if you do have a ransomware attack, if you hire a reputable firm, we have hooks into other firms. So there are firms that sometimes accidentally have been delivered a universal decryptor. Example, if you get hacked by Mazery Gregor, I have a universal decryptor. I can decrypt it. So the cost benefit analysis of, hey, these people are gonna charge me $15,000 to decrypt everything that's a reputable firm, we don't have to deal with a bad actor, um, is obviously gonna be, is gonna work out a lot better for you. Um, but threat actors make mistakes. I mean, I got the maze decryptor because when they sent me the decryptor to just decrypt those files, they accidentally sent me the universal decryptor. And I don't, obviously it wasn't on purpose, obviously, and we've shared that with the FBI, so that if someone contacts the FBI with a Mazer E. Gregor case, the FBI can decrypt those, can decrypt those files for them, or deliver it. Yeah, and there's kind of two pieces, too, with that, you know, part of negotiation in a ransomware case will always make sure that they can prove their decryptor works. So if you're working with, like, a lock bit, they'll say, send us some encrypted files, we'll send them over, they send them back, and they're, they're clean. Um, but in terms of the forensic piece, Really what we're trying to assess is, I mean, there's a couple pieces, right? And it's not only forensics, but it's also the incident response and the recovery. Can we recover without using any sort of decryptor? There's always risk when you're using like a universal decryptor or you're using some, uh, 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 you know, home-built method to try to decrypt something that we might ruin files. So our number one goal is to recover from good backups. Obviously, that's the, the best case scenario. And the forensics is really to help them understand, because if we don't negotiate and we don't pay, they're not, we're not gonna know everything that they took. So the forensics is going to be, uh, can we pinpoint what data was exfiltrated so that we know our legal requirements to disclose? And then can we pinpoint how they got in so that we know what we need to button up? Obviously, in most of these situations, there's a lot they need to button up, um, but that's really what we're trying to do as, as we're continuing with the containment and eradication. Sure. 
Um, so you, you see a bit of both. Uh, generally, um, in our firm, you know, we do security services, but generally when we come out, we, we have a client you know, at that point. Um, there, it's a little bit tricky because when it comes to insurance, if they're making a claim, they will not provide funds for betterment. They will provide you funds to get back to business operational state that you were before. So it becomes a tricky line to, to walk, um, understanding obviously they're going through a significant uh, event. You know, there's probably some business downtime associated with it, some loss of revenue. So, um, you know, how do we balance out, you know, getting everything back, back to the way it was, but then, you know, we gotta have conversations about making sure this doesn't happen again. Generally, when you go through a significant event, you know, I think uh, out of all of the ransomware cases, I think maybe one client that I had didn't become a client of ours or work with another firm and, you know, improve their security posture. Um, so there's kind of on a, our two, two fronts. On the, um, uh, if we're trying to prove the decryptor works, so that's a piece of the proof of life that they can decrypt files in a ransomware attack, we don't want to use any sensitive files. So we want it to be like a picture of the building or something like that, um, so that we're not feeding them sensitive information that they might not have had in the past. Um, on the other side for proof of life, again, this was a unique case because generally they won't give you a choice. They'll just send you some files that they have and we got to go dig and see if that actually was the client's files. Um, in this case, we wanted it to be, since they were giving us the choice, we wanted it to be without a doubt, yes, this is our file. It could have only come from us um, and you know, uh, the, them proving just from us selecting files out of a file tree, obviously that they had copies of them. Got one all the way back. Mm -hmm. I would say they're dev like for this group when we contact the FBI because FBI helped us come up like fill in some gaps that we had um, this is definitely a sell um, they were very organized and obviously like anytime you're committing a crime you're gonna make a phone call you're gonna be nervous um, the threat actor comms were very pointed, very almost articulate, but for a non-English speaker. So you, um, and sometimes, you know, I hate to say it for like, you baffle them with bullshit. You use words that they're, they're American terminology that they, are, that they may not be familiar with um, to feel them out. Like someone who comes from Croatia isn't gonna speak the same, isn't gonna understand the same American figures of speech of someone who's, let's say from London. Um, you know, their, their level of understanding is different. Um, so you have to use all that to your advantage, but these guys were definitely a sell. Um, I don't think that the, at one point in time, the emails definitely did not come from the same person, even though it was the same email address. Um, just how they punctuated things were a little unique. Um, were, it was just a little bit unique, the one guy, and then the next person, uh, the next person that was involved, um, they almost, like they were an English, like an American, English, native English speaker. Like everything was, um, he used the term y'all, you know, and <laughs> it was just something like, I'm American, I don't use it. So, when, and he used it properly and it was punctuated properly. So those are things, you know, y'all, comma, and you're like, okay, that, that's a big one. But those are things that you share with law enforcement. Hey, we'll take a look at this because it breaks the mold. Um, a lot of these cells will have someone who's American that lives abroad or on their payroll. Also, you have to understand some of these people that are doing threat or comms, you have to figure out sometimes, do they know that they're actually committing a crime? Um, I've worked with threat actor groups that the person that's a threat actor negotiator thinks that they're a consultant. So one of the rules is you never tell them they committed a crime. You know, so since that's one of the tenets, you never say, hey, you did this to us. It's always, can you help us? Um, but, you know, some directors, they don't even know. Like, they're hired to do a job. Hey, these guys have an outage. You're going to get in. You're going to negotiate payment for us. Um, we are, they're overseas. We're paid in Bitcoin. Um, you, as you get to know some of these guys, it gets to be a little bit weird. Um, and when it comes to, if it does deal with a ransomware attack, the big boy, Sonikibi, Lockbit, Medusa's Locker, 
their help desk is amazing. Better than some of the ones that are here. Like if you have a problem with a SQL server, obviously they've been in your environment, they've reconned your environment, and I've had them tell me ahead of time, you're gonna have a hard time decrypting this SQL server. Use this instead of this. Do it in this order. Like they'll guide you through the process. Um, because they know one day you're gonna sit up on stage and you're gonna tell a bunch of people you don't <laughs> know that this group has good customer service, yeah. which is totally ridiculous. But. Yeah, and, and the way these threat groups are, and uh, you know, Sean alluded to it there, they're different organizations almost. You might have the main you know, silent ransom group who are the operators who are doing the infiltration and the exfiltration, and then they have some other group that they outsource their communications to. Um, you know, one of the, the areas, you know, I know, and I was surprised we didn't have much AI talk here, uh, yeah, here today, but one of the places that ChatGPT is being used, you know, everyone's afraid they're gonna be crafting malware. No, they're using it to write better phishing emails. They're using it for negotiations so that you can't figure out what group they're a part of and you know, where they're coming from. It's gonna make our job a little bit more difficult to, you know, moving forward, but those are the types of things that they're starting to use it for. So um, there are, uh, it's called the OFAC sanction list. So there are known threat actors. Generally, they're tied to terrorist groups or state-sponsored activity, so Russia, China, North Korea, um, that are known that you cannot pay them. You legally cannot pay them. Outside of those groups, and that's why whenever we do make a payment, we always uh, collaborate with the FBI. We check the OFAC sanctions list. We work with uh, Breach Council to also do those same checks. We have to make sure that they're not on that list. And then outside of that, if they're not, it's a business decision at that point. To add on top of what Will said, these organizations have business plans, like Conti. They're on the OFAC list. They migrated from ransomware to BECs because with BECs, you don't know who you're paying. They have fallback plans, and they kick in their playbook, usually within you know, 48 to 72 hours, that they immediately migrated over. If you spend a lot of time on the dark web or you use any cyber intelligence, like uh, any threat intelligence platforms and stuff like that, you start seeing these people that you identify on some of these forums that you pretty much are pretty sure who they're attached to. Um, you start realizing that the things they're talking about has just changed. Hey, you know, can you do this on Windows with a PowerShell script if I embed it in an email? Well, this guy works for Connie. Why do they care about email? That's not their attack vector. But so they change their tactics to mask. And then they'll rebrand, just like a lot of our companies do, rebrand and enter back into industry as a whole nother name. Uh, they'll change their, um, their ransomware payloads. They'll do those kind of things and they'll come back as a ransomware provider. I think after Conti got put on that list about a month later, there was a new group that came out called Monty. Who could that have been? Yeah. Um, any other questions? I know we're a little over on time, but uh, any other questions? Okay, well thanks everyone, uh, it was a pleasure uh, speaking today, so thanks so much.